I'm going to be reading again out of Philippians chapter 3. And uh, I, want to, I, want, I, I love the prophetic. I love the, um, the excitement. I love the anticipation. I love the words that have been declared. I love the, um, the, the sense of forward momentum. I love the, being able to take that word and make it part of you and, and, and confess, believe, uh, declare that word. I, I love it. I love the excitement. I love it. I, I love the positivity of it. I love it. Uh, being a father... Being a, a natural father, but also being a father in the family of God and, a, and looked upon more as a father in the spirit in that sense. And you, you, things change for you. Things, it's, it's like the more that thing comes upon you or that heart rises in you, it's almost like you, you, the, things change. Things change from being concerned about this and maybe about my life, my ministry, my whatever, or just the things around me, you start to take on a quite a different perspective of the church, of the family of God, of those you influence, and the, big, the bigger picture comes into view more and more. And I know what, I kind of, I'm getting a sense of what Paul meant when he's saying to one of the churches, I, I don't, I, I, I'm going to labor until Christ is fully formed in you. His desire was that Christ would be fully formed in the people that he had given his life to build up and strengthen and to establish in the gospel. And so what I'm going to share today is not, there's nothing fluffy in it. And I, and I say that with all due respect. There's, some of it may be a bit challenging for some. Some of it may be, it, what I've got to share today, I, uh, the title of my message is Building Spiritual Backbone. It's really important that we build spiritual backbone. Uh, the five-minute wonder person is the person who receives the message with joy and gladness and, and they're excited for a while, but as soon as a bit of heat comes, as soon as a bit of pressure becomes, because there's no root, there's no spine, there's no digging down, there's nothing establishing them, that as soon as that happens, they wither up and they die. I don't want any of you, when you experience a bit of heat, to wither up and fail or to wither up and die. I don't want any of the younger believers who have come into the kingdom this year, just because a bit of heat comes your way, a bit of persecution comes your way, a bit of rejection comes your way from a family member or a friend or some other gang member or whatever it was, this gang, whatever, some other gang member, whatever. Uh, I, don't, I don't want that to put you up. I want you to develop spiritual backbone. Those of you who have been on the Lord for some time but may not have, may not have dug down to the point where you're willing to say, regardless of what comes, regardless of what challenges, regardless of what difficulties, I am going to stand. With all the grace and the strength that Jesus gives me, I've decided to completely identify with Jesus Christ. I'm not a part-time Christian. I'm not a pew-warming Christian person. I'm not a church-going person who lives one thing or puts on an act for at least an hour or two on a Sunday, but then really my, my life is really different the rest of the week. I don't want you to live like that, and I don't want to live like that myself. I want to be somebody who's fully identified with Christ in this world. I want to be a person who's fully identified with Him. Now, that has all sorts of repercussions, but the repercussions are part of the deal. We talked about last week about the sufferings of Christ. And it's my view, and I have, believe I have a, a biblical case for this, that the sufferings of Christ are not sickness, disease, and demonization. The sufferings of Christ, Christ is not depression in that sense. It's, 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 it's not a hopelessness. That's not the sufferings of Christ. But the, but the Bible talks about the sufferings of Christ. And there's an, there's an allergicness to this message, if you like. There's an allergic reaction that goes on in some quarters whenever you mention the is issue of suffering. And dare you mention the issue of martyrdom. 
like this allergic reaction goes on because people have taken beautiful songs like you are good, you are good, you are good, which is absolutely true, but then they've taken the humanistic idea of what goodness looks like and tried to superimpose that on the character and the image and the goodness of God. And it's, and, and it's got actually little to do with a humanistic idea of goodness. It's got everything to do with the absolute holiness and purity and integrity of God, which is manifested in the love of God toward us in Jesus Christ. And that's not a weak, whimpering, allergic to disappointment kind of deal, which is so often the case in, in humanity right now, where lot, too many of us have an entitlement attitude and we can't handle disappointment. We can't handle not getting our way. If we raise our children in such a way that they always get their way, we are doing them a terrible disservice. Because life does dish out some things that are potentially disappointing. But if we're allergic to disappointment because we've always gotten our way, then we're in for real difficulty in life. And so... Being able to handle disappointment, being able to process that, being able to deal with it in the light of what Jesus said. See, see, some people have made up some promises that they think the Bible says. And then they try and claim them. And then if, they, if God doesn't come through on that made up or misunderstood promise, then they get ticked off with God. But the bottom line is they're getting ticked off with God on a promise he never made. Jesus never promised us that we would have a cotton wool easy ride from the day we get saved until the day we're promoted to glory. If you think that, my friend, you've, you've, you've taken up an idea which has never been presented in the gospel. Is the love of God like cotton wool? I've had, an, I've had experiences where just basking in the love of God and it's felt like I've just been absolutely wrapped in cotton wool. That's the only way I can describe it. But total love all around, total security, total identity, total, total identity as a son of God. I'm, I'm not talking about that. that that's, that's, that's the love of God. <laughs> but the love of God, when you experience that, also prepares you for challenge and difficulty because that love of God becomes your identity point and your benchmark and your point of reference, not the circumstance or the pressure you're experiencing in that moment. So I want us... I want personally to continue to grow with spiritual backbone. When pressure comes on, when challenges come on, I don't want to become jelly. I don't want to become some, some bombed out, ineffective, unable to stand up, unable to make decisions, unable to move on in life, jelly, because of some pressure. Spiritual backbone, spiritual spine. Spiritual backbone enables us to carry load, carry the weight of God's, of God's responsibilities for us. It enables us to carry leadership pressure. It enables us to carry uh, uh, times of persecution and resistance enables us and we're able to stand in it we're able to carry the load and we're able to go the distance and we're able to see the fruitfulness and get the reward because i'm talking about spiritual backbone and so in philippians 3 i'm reading from the passion translation last week i talked about the context of this being the fact that paul was saying that look as far as my prior spiritual life was concerned, when I was a Pharisee and being proud of being born a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin and, 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 and being a Pharisee of Pharisees and totally keeping the law the way I saw it and, 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 and being confident in my own righteousness before the God, he said, I realized that I had to count all of that as rubbish or as dung or as Mr. Pooh. And I embraced Christ and I embrace fully, and I have no longer any pride or confidence in my intellectual prowess. I have my confidence in the shed blood of Christ and the fact that He is the Son of God, He is the Anointed One, and that's where my righteousness comes from. It comes from my faith in Him, and that's what Paul is talking That's the context here, but there's also context that can apply for us, principles that can apply for us. Verse 9 says this, 
My passion is to be consumed with Him and not clinging to my own righteousness based in keeping the written law. My righteousness will be His based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, the very righteousness that comes from God. Verse 10, And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully and to experience the overflowing power of His resurrection working in me. And if that was the full stop to that whole sentence and he changed subjects, that would be much easier to preach in an environment that doesn't like anything a little bit negative. We all want to, ex to experience, to know the wonders of Jesus more fully and to, experiencing the over and to experience the overflowing power of His resurrection working in us. That, that really is probably the heart cry to some degree of pretty well most of the people in this room. If you were like me, you wanted it, but if, if you had to pay for it or save for it or wait for it, that was the challenge. Some of us don't study the Scriptures too much because it takes too long to find the treasures. That's what we thought. So the pro so, and we think we want it all now. I, I, I just want it all now. I want, the, I want the download. I want the knowledge. I want the encounter. I want the experience. I want it now. I said to my pastor, look, do some study. I'll do the studies. You, 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 you mark them for me. He said, where's men of God aren't made overnight. He could tell I was just impatient to get the knowledge of God and to understand God, understand the gospel and understand. He said, where's men, men of God aren't made overnight. It was a tremendous piece of advice. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully and to experience the overflowing power of His resurrection working in me. I will be one with Him in His sufferings and I will be one with Him in His death. Only then will I be able to experience complete oneness with Him and His resurrection from the realm of death. That's the resurrection on the last day. And people have debate, debated this issue of, well, okay, to come into the knowledge of the resurrection and the deeper knowledge of who Jesus is and what He's done, that means somehow I have to identify with Him in His sufferings. But I thought Jesus suffered. There's no more suffering in heaven because after all, there's no suffering in heaven. At least that's what we're, we're sometimes told. But here we have Jesus, uh, Paul talking about the sufferings of Jesus as though somehow they're continuing. Is that a contradiction? What's this about? Is Jesus still suffering or, or is he beyond suffering, beyond the reach of suffering and he's sitting there and just people on earth are suffering? What's this about? What, what do you mean the sufferings of Jesus? What, what is that? Well, let's just let the Bible talk about it. How, how many remember the wonderful story of Saul being on the road to a city called Damascus with a letter of authority to take possession or take uh, into custody the followers of the way or the followers of Jesus and to take them back to Jerusalem and have them tried, thrown in prison and possibly killed. How many people remember the story of, of, of Saul, this, this zealous uh, man that loved God and would absolutely believed he was doing the will of God and he's on the way suddenly, <laughs> this great flashing light all around him. He falls to the ground, and then this voice speaks out of heaven to him. Now, we'll go to, go to the reference. It's in Acts chapter 9. Reads quite well in the Passion. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. During those days, Saul, full of angry threats and rage, wanted to murder the disciples of the Lord Jesus. That's putting it plain, isn't it? So we went and asked the high priest and requested a letter of authorization 
uh, that he could take uh, to the Jewish leaders in Damascus, requesting their cooperation in finding and arresting any who were followers of the way or followers of Jesus. Uh, Saul wanted to capture all the believers he found, both men and women, and drag them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. So he obtained the authorization and left for Damascus. He was very serious about this. Just outside the city, a brilliant light flashing from heaven suddenly exploded all around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a booming voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? The men accompanying Saul were stunned and speechless, for they heard a heavenly voice but could see no one. Saul replied, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus the victorious, the one you are persecuting. What? What? Jesus has suffered, died, been laid in the tomb, been raised to life miraculously by the power of the Holy Ghost. He's in a glorified body beyond the reach of any form of, of, of the devilish stuff on earth. He's, been, he's, been, he's ascended, he's seated at the right hand of the Father in glory, in heaven. And Jesus is saying, why are you persecuting me? To a man on earth, Jesus so totally identifies with his body of believers on earth. We are so one. In fact, the word says we are one spirit with him. He so totally identifies with us. He so absolutely identifies and lives within us. When his body is being persecuted on earth, he is being persecuted. Jesus not only takes it personally, he feels it personally because it's his own body, it's his own people, it's his own beloved, it's his own bride, it's his own brothers and sisters who are being persecuted on the earth because they put their trust in him. Jesus is being persecuted. Wow. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm laying out some thought. I'm laying out what I believe is some biblical thought to help give us some spiritual backbone. In Matthew 25, there's this interesting statement. Sorry, there's this interesting account of a judgment that's going to happen sometime after the Lord returns. Matthew chapter 25 verse 31. When the Son of Man appeared, this is Jesus speaking, when the Son of Man appeared, who's the Son of Man? Jesus. It's one of his titles, one of his names. When he appears in his majestic glory, with all his angels by his side, he will take his seat on his throne of splendor. And all the nations will be gathered together before him. And like a shepherd who separates the sheep from the goats, he will separate all the people. The sheep he will put to his right, right side and the goats to his left side. If you were, if you were a Hebrew, the, the left and right issue is very significant. The right is the side of blessing. It's the side of power. It's the side of provision. The left hand is the side of cursing. It's the side of rejection. It's, it's so on and so forth. The right hand. He put the sheep on his right hand. Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father. So he's, there's going to be a judgment of all of the nations. Don't let anybody tell you that there's not going to be a judgment. Don't let anybody tell you that God doesn't do that anymore. There is a great judgment coming. 
on the earth after Jesus returns. He's coming back as the judge of the nation. He will have a rod of iron on his hand. The time for judgment is not yet, but there is a great judgment coming, my friends. I want you to have some spiritual backbone. I don't want you to get sucked into the religious humanism that is rising among too many in the earth right now. I want you to stay with the gospel that was originally delivered by Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't want you to get sucked into some humanistic thing which tries to make God out to be this fluffy Father Christmas deal who's just everybody's going to get in. It doesn't matter if people have a relationship with God. That's, that's going to be good, but everybody will get in. It's not the case. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Some of the philosophers are trying to tell you that all roads lead to God. It doesn't matter which way you choose. That's just an expression of confusion. Jesus wasn't confused. He's the truth made flesh. He dwelt among us. He Grace and mercy, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He is the truth. He proved it by rising from the dead. So he separate, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. He will put on his right hand the, go, uh, the sheep, on the left hand the goats. That's the left, isn't it? Then the king will turn, then the king. Then he, then he changes it from the son of man to the king. He's the king. This incredibly loving king who has spread out his arms and died for us and given us the greatest expression, the greatest point of understanding of the love of God that could ever possibly know him. I want to tell you, my friends, now is the time to be responding to the love of God, which has been so lavishly poured out for us, and to embrace him and come to him without resistance and completely yield our lives to him and embrace him so we become part of his family, so we're on that right side. But there is going to be a company on the left side. Because God is a God of justice. If you receive Christ, the judgment on sin has already taken place. He is our Passover. You are no longer a sub an object of wrath. But if you reject Christ, then you have to stand somehow on your own merit... You have to stand somehow, somehow on your own sense of righteousness and being okay with God to stand any sense of chance in your own conscience. But I want to tell you, my friends, that that is the, that is the place of the left. I'm not talking about politically. I'm talking about in this what Jesus is talking about. That's the place of the left. That's where we're reliant on ourselves. I want to tell you, don't be reliant on yourself. Give yourself to Christ. Invite Christ into your life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He shed his blood for you. Buddha didn't shed his blood. Muhammad didn't shed his blood. Zen didn't shed his blood. Confucius didn't shed his blood. None of them shed their blood. They all died seeking God. But I want to tell you, my friends, Jesus shed his blood. And he shed his blood as the spotless lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And he wants to take away your sin so that you stand on that right hand. There's another issue here as well, which is really interesting. Then the king will turn to those on his right and say, you have a special place in my father's heart. Come and experience the full inheritance of the kingdom realm that has been destined for you from before the foundation of the world. For when you saw me hungry... And you fed me. And when you found me thirsty and you gave me something to drink and when I had no place to stay, you invited me in. And when I was poorly clothed, you covered me. And when I was sick, you tenderly cared for me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. Remember the context of what we're talking about here? Then the godly will answer him and say, Lord, when... When did we see you hungry or thirsty or give you food or something to drink? How do you mean we saw you? 
when did we see you without a place to stay or invite you in? When did we see you poorly clothed or and cover you? When did, when did we see you sick and tenderly care for you or in prison and visit you? What? How do you, how do you mean when you were sick? How do you mean when you were in prison? How, how do you mean when you were naked? How do you mean when you had nowhere to stay? How, how do you mean when you were hungry? What, what do you mean? And the king will answer them, do you not know? When you cared for one of the least important of these, my little ones, the new King James says, the least of these, my brethren. When you cared for the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. Remember Jesus speaking from heaven and saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Remember Paul saying that, that to know the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of his resurrection, and, and to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to tell you, my friend, officially, the Christian church, the body of Christians on the earth today are the most persecuted group on the earth today. That, that's fact. But, but God is so powerful and God protects, of course God protects. Every one of those believers whose spirit is who, who's persecuted, their spirit is completely safe in the hands of the Lord. They may be able to kill their body, but they cannot kill their spirit and they cannot take their eternal life away from them. I want, to, I, want to try and have, I want us to have some spiritual backbone. I want us to have some guts. I want us to have, us, I want us to have some determination for 2018. I don't, I don't want us to be wimps. I don't want us to be consumed with first world problems. My car's got a rattle. My truck gets a rattle sometimes and it annoys me. Like, the seat's this and, and then next start it hasn't. I, I don't know what that's about, but... It's not a biggie. Janet's car's got a rattle. I, I rode around on the back of that car one day while Janet was driving around the back roads trying to find where that rattle was. <laughs> I was in the boot. Don't tell the local constable. I was in the boot. Janet was driving sensibly. I was in the boot trying to find this rattle. Didn't find it. I don't like rattles in cars. You hear what I'm saying? But it's not a biggie. It's not a biggie. I come back to, the, I come back to feeling very grateful that I've got a vehicle to drive around in. And you can throw stuff in the back. And if, and if you can't get around and the road's too narrow, you just drive over the curb. I often say to the Janet, that's why I've got a four-wheel drive. But I want to tell you, we can get consumed with first world problems. I want you to have some spiritual backbone. I want you to have some guts. I don't want you to fall over when you have a bit of persecution, when you have a bit of trouble. When a bit of trouble comes your way, I want to tell you, my friends, God is God in the trouble. He's God in the victory and He's God in the trouble. And the reason sometimes we have trouble is that we can learn how to be a victor so that the next time trouble comes our way, we, can, we know from past experience that God got us through that one. So we, we approach this one with greater confidence, but we can also encourage other people that, hey, that problem that's coming your way, it doesn't have to be the end. Hey, look, God has been faithful. God has been good. God is this. God is that. And we can face this challenge and we can go through or we can go over. We're not going to fall over and... And, and lie down on the ground with our legs in the air because the problems come our way. Yeah. Jesus so identifies with his people that when his people suffer, he takes it personally 
and he is suffering. That's, that's a phenomenal thing. But here's the issue. This whole judgment that's talked about here is the whole basis of it and the, and the end results for these people, the, the goat group and the sheep group, is entirely dependent on how they responded to somebody that was one of Jesus' brethren. Wow. Does this mean that salvation is by works? No, it's not. But there's something really interesting here that reveals Jesus' heart. Do you know that in the Western world, we, we've got the potential to become so individualistic and so individualized in terms of our my breakthrough, my ministry, my anointing, my this, my promise, my prophecy, my, my, my future, my, my salary, my house, my investments, my retirement fund, whatever, the my, my, my. And, 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 and we're, we're pressing into God for his principles and his keys to have this great, successful, prosperous life. But I want to tell you, my friends, we can become so focused on that that some poor person next to us who's really struggling can get completely ignored Lord. Or what's even worse is that we get proud of our success and the principles we were able to operate to bring that success that we despise the poor person who's struggling that hasn't learned those things yet and there's a despising of them. And I want to tell you, my friends, that sets up a toxic thing in our heart which really actually affects the attitude of God toward us. Whoa. Go into Proverbs and see what happens to the person who despises the poor. My heart for us this, this year is that one of the things we're going to be doing is looking for the opportunities we can have to minister into situations where the, the family of God are in, uh, are in persecuted situations. Doorways, some doorways have opened up possibly into Pakistan to be able to minister to the leaders and minister into situations there where some of those leaders, whatever they do, they do at the risk of their lives. You hear what I'm saying? There's some are going to be going into India. Some are going into, into uh, Indonesia where uh, uh, similar situations can happen where you do things at the risk. And are we going to recoil? Are we going to pull back and just keep ourselves safe and just look after our life? Or are we going to invest our lives into ministering to the one who was put in prison for their faith or the one whose goods were confiscated because of their faith or their house was confiscated because of their faith or because they were rejected and cast out of their family because of their faith? Are we going to go after and minister into those people and actually minister to Jesus? Whoa, come on now. Are we going to have an internal focus and be just blessing the city, which I'm all into in the sense of blessing the city, or are we going to be looking for situations where we can really effectively minister into situations beyond us, into persecuted church situations, and really make a difference? And really show the love of God into situations that might be risky places for us to go. I want us to have some spiritual backbone. I don't want us to be consumed with first world problems. And I don't want any of you on the left. I don't want to be on the left and I don't want anybody. But isn't our salvation sure? Yes, yes it is. Let's just not mess up our theology too much. But hey, I'm reading a story that Jesus, that Jesus told which was not a parable. This is not a parable. This is saying, and the son, when the Son of Man returns in His glory with His angels with Him. We're talking about an, a future event which is sure. What are you doing with your love? What are we doing with our love? What are we doing with the love God's given us? I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm just asking the question, what are we doing with the love that God's given us? What are we doing with that finance that God's given us? What are we doing to look for opportunities to say, hey, I can bless that person. I can bless that one. I can't bless 500,000. I can bless that one. I can, I can sow into that orphanage. I can look after those orphans. I can't look after all of the orphans in the world. There's too many, but I can look after 
those ones. I can look after that one. I can minister to that one. Otherwise, prosperity doesn't have a context. I want us all to prosper, but I don't want us all to become fat, lazy, and self-satisfied. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. Spiritually fat and lazy. Hear what I'm saying? I don't care about your body shape. That's not my business. Nor is mine yours. But your spiritual body shape is my business. And my spiritual body shape is my business. One last thing. Just to firm this up. In Matthew chapter 12, we have a situation where Jesus is ministering and his brothers and his mother come to talk with him. They don't come into the house. They come to talk with him. I think they thought he was, one commentator says they thought he was mad. They wanted to come and talk with him. So some, some of the brethren come in and say, hey, um, hey Jesus, your, your, your brothers and your mother are outside. They want to talk to you. Jesus turns around and says this, who, are my true, who is my true mother and brothers? My true mother, brothers and sisters are those who do the will of God. What's the first step in the will of God? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. That's the first work of God. We believe on Him. So I just wanted to help you understand that Jesus so identifies with His people that the way the world the way each nation treats Jesus' brethren is going to have an eternal repercussion. In the meantime, while this challenge is going on, why in some parts of the world the persecution is intense, why in some parts of the world there's significant challenges for our family, we are mindful of that. And we look for opportunities to bless, to pray, to sow, to encourage, to, to sow resource, resources into those situations. I want to tell you, my friends, because it's Jesus' very own brethren. It's our very own brethren. It's our family. It's our family. Jesus so identifies with his family, and when they're persecuted, he says, you're persecuting me. So when you bless a little child and give that little child a drink, you're actually blessing Jesus. This is the whole point. This is what he said. Even the one who gives a little one a, a drink will not lose his reward. Wow. Because this is love expressed. This is, this is true righteousness. Righteousness is not just our position with God, having received the righteousness by faith of, of Christ's own righteousness. Righteousness is really the actual flow of life and the flow of godly goodness that comes out of our heart, out of our life and flows into the nations. That's the expression of our righteousness. A number of years ago, I'm finishing on this, a number of years ago, quite a number of years ago when we had the offices and the house on Hallsville Road. We bought a house there, we set it up as our offices, had a flat at the back, Mervyn Glennis rented it for a while, so on and so forth. We'd gone through a little bit of a challenging time, bit of a challenging time, and there was you know, a bit of discouragement in the air, and dear Glennis came into the, office and she's, into the office one morning, and she said, how is it, Wes? How's it going? How's it going, really? What sort of... And I looked to Grant and I said, any reports yet of anybody being fed to the lions or, or stoned? Grant said, no, none at all, none today. I looked at Glenn, I said, it's a great day then. It's all about perspective. We have our little, little first world problems, but nobody's been fed to lions today. 
Nobody's been hung on a cross and crucified for being a follower of Jesus today. Nobody, no, nobody's been, you, you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> it's about perspective. And your perspective often will determine the strength of your spine, of your spiritual spine. Because we're men and women of God. At all age level, all, right from being in the Lord for 50, 60, 70 years, right through to being in the Lord for a week. But I want to tell you, my friends, those of us who have been in the Lord for a while, we, we can develop such a, a level of strength in our spine, we become like a tree in the house of the Lord. We become like a tree planted by, the living, living, by living water. We become like that great plant that grows up in such a way that our spread is so big that all sorts of little birds can come and nest in us and find peace and shelter. We can become that tree. We can become that strength. We can become that place of shelter because we've developed some spiritual spine, some spiritual strength. Jesus identifies with his family when they're being persecuted. So don't take it as an unusual thing. It is actually par for the course. But if we recoil from it, we won't really get to experience the fullness of the power of the resurrection. Because sometimes, my friend, in the challenge of difficulty, that's when the power of the resurrection is experienced the most. So let's not be gutless. Let's not be wimps. Let's not, let's not faint from the battle. Let's not pull back from the front line. Let's not be soldiers who leave our posts. Let's be people who are committed to the cause, who are committed to the battle, who are committed uh, to walk with Christ. We're committed to him and we're committed to the whole family. Let's all stand. We're committed to the whole family. So we're going to be increasing our care of some vulnerable people this year. We're going to be increasing our care of people who have no other resources coming their way, but we can help them. Some of them will be in Pakistan. Some of them will be in Indonesia. Some of them might be in, will be in Africa. Some of them will be in New Zealand. Some of them will be somewhere else because we're, we're, we, we've got a big family that we're connected to and our love is going to go out from us and the righteousness is going to go out from us and there's going to be a great harvest from it. Amen? It's going to be awesome. What a great year we're in for and the power and the presence of God. Father, I want to thank you for these amazing people, every one of them, and all of the ones, Lord, that you've, you've revealed Jesus to and you've, 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 you've given yourself for and you've, you've washed them and cleansed them and made them part of your family. And Lord, I want to thank you that you so closely identify with us and your whole body in the earth that when we suffer, you suffer. And yet you give us the strength and the ability and Father, you delight when we share our goods with our brothers and sisters. We want to bring delight to your heart and strength to the family. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Turn to somebody and say, I'm going to be helping somebody this year.